Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 786. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is February 3rd, 2023. All right, welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscript. Yep, 786, it's quite a bit, but we love doing it. It's fun to do. We're glad that you're edified by it. And George and I always pray before the program, and we pray f- foremost that by the time we stop recording this episode, God has been glorified and not Kevin and George. George, how's the weather over there? It started to rain today. We've had some very lovely balmy days in the mid 70s, low 80s last few weeks, right. last week. Yeah. It's going to get cold again, they tell me this weekend, because evidently you people in the far north, you know, near the Arctic Circle in New York and Washington, uh, are experiencing cold, cold weather. Yeah, and I should warn people, it's supposed to rain here in like a half hour or something. I'll have to put the mute button on my uh, microphone on and off when I talk. I'm warning you ahead of time because an RV is not, it, it's kind of rain adverse. It's like being in a, a, a tin uh, roofed uh, shed because you hear the rain and that's that's part of RV life. George, um, well, before we get too far, please like the show, um, subscribe friend us or like us and stuff like that and comments george there was a lot of comments this week well i would mention on the likes if you don't like the show you'll see i have a guitar in the background i do what i call a peter paul and mary service really and Mm -hmm. uh, i'll get out the guitar and start singing puff the magic dragon if i had a hammer (laughs) and michael row the boat ashore if you're not careful Uh in a lovely baritone voice with an out of tune child's guitar uh, uh, this is a threat unless you like the show. We'll start having musical interludes. And people like music for any reason whatsoever. I wouldn't say that. So um, we have a, a comment section, and a lot of people went to the comment section this week when George talked about yoga and when Kevin talked about Fatima. And uh, that's what the comment section's for. We, we don't mind you going there and expressing a little bit of anger. Kevin, you don't know what they're talking about. George, what's, what, what's with yoga? And we appreciate that. And... Um, that's what the comment section's for, George. Yes, it is. And also, you sort of get to know us a little bit better. Ke- uh, both in Kev- Kevin and I both venerate the Virgin Mary. We uh, hold her in great esteem. We she- she think she's one of the saints of God. However, we do not uh, accept some of the more strongly held views, such as her uh, apparitions and visitations mm-hmm. and private messages given to people. I, I mean, as good Protestants, we uh, believe she died. If you want to do a little research, it was somewhere in Turkey uh, a couple millennia ago, and um, that's that's just a Protestant belief. And uh, but we understand fully that this show is seen by uh, every denomination for sure, and people who are outside the Christian Church as well. We we know that Mormons watch the show. Hi, Mormons. And so we, we appreciate that. We understand the, aud- the audience is big. And please, you know, understand who we are. We're Anglicans, and it's Anglican Unscripted. And sometimes we'll say things and, that are a little uncomfortable for you to hear. And there are two, two items that a Roman Catholic must hold as an item of faith concerning Mary that came about in the 19th century were promulgated, which Anglicans specifically have said, no, we don't believe those because they're not in Scripture. Now, they could be adduced from Scripture, which is the argument, but they're not in Scripture. And an Anglican, in his Articles of Religion, says if it's not in Scripture, you can't be forced to believe it. Mm-hmm. So so just, take, you know, from the beg- very beginning, you have to understand that Anglicans have a different understanding of Mary. It may work for your spirituality, but it doesn't work for all who are believers in Jesus Christ. Correct. All right, so let's move on to the news and we're going to start with the Church of England. And if God is loving, we will not have to finish with the Church of England today. So let's uh, start. Um, I, I don't even know where it starts. But coming next week is going to be the Synod. And mm-hmm. so what what is happening this week is people are uh, really taking sides on the LLF and, and trying to articulate. We're finally hearing from the conservative bishops 
we're finally uh, seeing a petition going forward and, and being signed that uh, refutes the understanding of LLF and um, wants the uh, Synod not to go forward with blessing same-sex unions and same-sex marriages. So that's where we are this week. And we have an additional thing that happened this week. I was reading on that wonderful website called Anglican.inc that a bishop has uh, found a person that may be guilty of a, a hate crime, so he called the cops. The Bishop of Coventry. And, you know, last week I named the show The Dystopian Church. A week later, a bishop says, I can do better. I can, ma I can make it <laughs> worse than Dystopian, George. So uh, let's talk about what's happening this week and uh, the Bishop of, what's his, Bishop of Coventry and uh, go from there, George. Yeah, I think this is a good way to approach this because it's all one story, all these four or five things we'll mention because yeah. it's all moving in the same direction. But if we sort of move in circles from outward in, this week, uh, the Bishop of Coventry, Christopher Coxworth, who's supposed to be an evangelical, or he once was, called the police to report Sam Margrave, a member of General Synod from his diocese. In the picture, you can see Sam Margrave speaking at General Synod and said that Sam Margrave was making, uh, I want him investigated for a hate crime because Sam Margrave has been tweeting uh, that, uh, you know, upholding the biblical doctrines of sexuality questioning uh, some questioning as ungodly and uh, unconstitutional the actions of the bishops and the bishop instead of responding with argument or with prayer or with pastoral guidance calls the cop on the cops on somebody who has bad think um, this is where we are in the church of england now this is not new the, the gay lobby jane ozan yeah has been calling for the cops to intervene to arrest everybody who disagrees with her and drive them out of the church. And Sam Margrave has been in touch. He's one of our viewers. And uh, we salute his courage in this because he stands strongly. Sure. And just so that you don't think we're all cast, cut from the same cloth, Sam was a longtime labor counselor, a uh, political liberal. Uh, so it's not all, but a political liberal can still believe be an orthodox believer in Jesus Christ, just as a political conservative can be an orthodox believer in Jesus Christ. So mm -hmm. we're not talking secular politics here. No. Uh, Sam, Sam doesn't know what exactly he said. Maybe it's just the volume of the, the tenor of his work is, is homophobic, quote unquote. Or uh, recently he pointed out that Peter Tatchell, who's a longtime gay activist in England and in the Church of England, uh, he went with Jane Ozan to Pickett, the Archbishop of Canterbury's home, a week ago Monday, and Welby came out and talked to them. Tatchell is also calling for relaxing the age of consent for uh, sex so that 12-year-olds uh, can have sexual relations with uh, uh, adults. And Sam's saying, we really don't need to take lessons on morality from someone that is uh, promoting ebiophilia, which is the technical term because uh, yes. not pedophilia are prepubescent, but ebiophilia, postpubescent, but still far from mature children. And this caused the expect the demons all howled in outrage. And they probably got on to Christopher Coxworth. And he did one of two things. He either basically was so cowed by the left that he just went on with them, or he said, look, I'm not going to fight this guy. I'm not going to fight your fight. I'll just hand it to the police and let them decide. Either way, it's a father and God, Christopher Coxworth, really let down the show. Uh, we, as the Bible said in last week's readings, he shall be among the least of them uh, in the kingdom Well, for being a false teacher. I want to back up a, a little bit here and talk about demonic response. Uh, you, clearly, we, we're in a church uh, in this millennia that does not often recognize the devil, uh, Lucifer, or demons or demonic response. And what we've seen through scripture and what we've seen certainly within the Episcopal Church is those who are under that type of influence respond with the scream, with the outrageous overblown response, uh, the non-Christian response. You were telling me uh, about the Minnesota uh, General Synod, not uh, the General, um, 
general w- convention general convention where uh, people had salt sprayed around their their area and they had a demonic response and yeah Nelson, ni- it was 1997 and I actually saw this happen 1997 general convention in Philadelphia it was mm-hmm. my first general convention as a reporter as a as a I was more of a gopher than anything else mm-hmm. for the American Anglican Council and I was in Philadelphia and I was at that time doing my diaconate work at a hospital in Philadelphia as a chaplain and Nelson Kosheski, I think is his last name, I can't pronounce it, uh, he's now in the ACNA, uh, was a priest of the Diocese of Fort Worth, one of their Fort Worth delegations. And he took, he took a sacramental, which is blessed salt, and he sprinkled it around the table of the delegates of, of uh, Fort Worth and the table next to them, the Diocese of Newark, as a protection, a hedge against the enemy. Well, one of these delegates was Louis Crew, and Louis Crew went to an absolute spasm of outrage. Just, I don't want to say foaming at the mouth and eyes rolling, but you get the picture. Yeah, sure. And Frank Griswold, you know, basically uh, had to uh, uh, condemn Nelson for praying for deliverance from the demonic. And you know if you read scripture the response to the presence of sacramentals of the of holy things by the demons are the sorts of responses you see so that was 30 years ago is that 30 years ago almost Almost 30 30 years years ago ago, yeah almost 30 years ago we saw that from louis crew and we see that today in On uh, on twitter uh we see the same degree of now a psychologist would say that's just narcissistic uh behavior uh these people don't uh, have fully well, we, developed egos well but we also see that you know in abortion uh rights protests when an abortion rights person is uh, a, a pro-life person is in attendance near an abortion clinic you'll see them screaming to stop the prayers <laughs> screaming to uh, get them out of here they'll call the cops to arrest them uh in uh the, the, in britain now there's places you can no longer uh, even have silent prayers you know the the demons know one thing prayer works that mm-hmm. uh when you are able to engage your relationship with the living god it works and they don't want it to work and they don't want you to think it works just to mention that uh, Isabel von something or other, the uh, woman who was arrested in uh, uh, for praying, oh, yeah. Yeah. the uh, prosecution just announced they're going to drop the case. However, they haven't closed the case, which means they can bring it up at any time. So they're always going to have that threat over her. But there's been a slight victory where the hearings have been canceled and there doesn't seem to be any further action taken for praying near a, uh, an, a silent prayer at an abortion uh, zone mm-hmm. um, because what Isabel was doing was combating with the demons and if you have to sort of think logically if people don't believe this then Isabel's just wasting her time and is sending messages out into the into the void <laughs> yes. but if you are upset about this and thinks it's wrong then you're implicitly uh, accepting that she is engaged in a battle and you've mm-hmm. chosen to be on the other side of the side of the evil one in this battle Stop screaming. You're giving yourselves away. Oh, okay. So back back to the Church of England news. Back back to that. So, and the other other few things we had that David uh, Monteith, the new dean of Canterbury, who is partnered gay man, who the Church of Uganda said, that's it, we're done. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, Welby should have acted. And Welby said, well, I couldn't. It wasn't in my authority, even though he's on the committee that hired him. Monteith announced that the Thursday uh, February 2nd consecrations of two flying bishops, uh, Rob Monroe and Paul Thomas, I believe, one Anglo Catholic and one evangelical, they would not be live streamed because it's sort of problematical and would cause offense to some of the, to the majority of the Church of England who didn't accept their views. Well, this uh, hit the social media and there was an explosion and outrage of, you know, uh, 
uh, you hypocrite. You know, you were given a you were given a break and allowed to be dean, even though your life is offensive to the Lord in your personal habits. Um, and the church basically uh, winked and nodded and uh, closed their eyes. And now you're determining what is what is right and true, what others should see. Well, he backed down, and so the consecrations did take place. But they did have Sarah Mulally, the Bishop of London, in attendance in the ceremony though she didn't lay hands on them so they didn't catch girl cooties uh when they were consecrated but they just you know if people are saying trust us trust the liberals trust the establishment you have no reason to do so just on the issues of the last week alone of being of the police calling being called on you if you disagree or refusing to uh welcome your service and the third little thing, uh, they've replaced Welby and Cottrell had a bishop for the bishops. Uh, it's sort of an assistant administrator bishop. Uh, and they hired David Urquhart, retired Bishop of Birmingham. So what you say? Well, in 2020, Private Eye magazine published an expose about David uh, Urquhart's life which was that he lived with a young Indian man in a bachelor pad above the diocesan offices and had published love poems on social media about this young man. Well, at the time, I wrote to Bishop Urquhart and said, do you have any comment about the in insinuation of that you are something? And I got an email back from his uh, chaplain saying, or his secretary saying, well, he's on vacation, he'll get back to you. Hey, he's been on vacation for two years. Two. Uh, well, okay, George, you're being overcritical. I used to watch, in, in my youth, Peter Sellers movies, like uh, uh, Pink mm -hmm. Panther. Pink Panther had uh, uh, the lead character, Clouseau, had a uh, live-in uh, uh, butler. Maybe this is a live-in butler. Could be, Could but be? I don't think... I don't think the... Uh, <laughs> Well, you couldn't say what Peter Sellers said about his ye little yellow friend anymore. <laughs> yellow friend. No, you can't. Uh, uh, and but, I should have said uh, Chief Inspector, you know. Uh, Chief Clouseau. Inspector Cluzo. Yes. Well, yeah. well, again, you know, there are no cameras. We don't know. But the don't insinuation they? from Private Eye magazine was this, mm -hmm. and the bishop mm -hmm. did nothing to dissuade that. No. And then Colin Coward, who we mentioned last week, this must be the, we should get him on, Kevin, one day, <laughs> no, because geez. we've mentioned him so often. <laughs> Colin Coward, at that time, printed an article where he basically said, hooray, that the Bishop of Birmingham has found love at last. But if only he would be honest about it, because he votes against gay marriage, yet he is allegedly a partnered gay man. So if you're in the Church of England, you see conservatives arrested and harassed by the police at the behest of the bishops. You see the administration and the staff doubling down partnered gay man is the head of selection for the bishops of the Church of England. Now he, the number two, the uh, chief of staff, if you will, of the Welby and Cottrell is an allegedly partnered gay man. And you be... Well, it, it, it's at this point that we need to speak in a global sense. Um, Obviously, what happened with the, the Bishop of uh, uh, Coventry is a spark. He, th mm -hmm. he thought that he had enough cover within the Church of England, and he knew that uh, Justin Welby was out of town. Uh, he went to South Sudan uh, with the Pope to help down there. That, hey, I can call and, and file a complaint on Sam uh, Margaret. No big deal. Mm -hmm. If the Bishop of Coventry feels that way about his own lay people, what must he think about a visiting African bishop or a, a visiting Asian bishop who shows up in one of his churches and, and preaches what Sam uh, Margrave believes? What would happen, George? Would he call the cops on uh, an African bishop or primate as well? Well, attempts have been made in the past. I can remember Peter Tatchell once tried to do a citizen's arrest of Robert Mugabe. Remember that? He's not a bishop, nope. but a president yeah. of Zimbabwe because yeah. Mugabe... Uh, uh, it's been was quite a nasty dictator, but there are every time the global south primates come to the UK and preach, especially the Nigerian ones, we see these same characters from the left liberal lobby protesting that these people are allowed to pollute uh, 
and teach a false god. In other words, the there are no restraints anymore. The battle really has been joined, and we're going to see how it plays out. And the conservatives, the liberals are united, and they're united on the point that what the bishops are proposing is not enough. That's what we're seeing across the liberal spectrum. And we're seeing retired bishops like Paul Bays of Liverpool saying, they're right, this is not enough. We need to go all out and have gay marriage. And the bishops are the only people that I'm aware of who are supporting what they've come up with, which is this half measure of marriage is not holy matrimony, will have blessings of civil gay marriages and then but that's not a holy matrimony in the eyes of god therefore it doesn't change anything the only people who buy that line are the bishops and here's the, the thing they don't care about all the criticism that they've received from the left or the right now yeah when you and i say there's no theological basis well we don't care we tell them there's no reason basis when you know uh, theology uh, reason, tradition, and there's no tradition to and back scripture. you up. And scripture, they don't care. There's, there's nothing, there's nothing. There's just political pressure from the left mm -hmm. and the bishop's determination to hold on to power. This is all about power. But this, and, now, I, I also want to draw a distinction between this and women, cler women clergy and women uh, bishops. They, they tried and, and lied and said there would be mutual flourishing. Here, they put together a system where if a priest does not toe the line and conduct same-sex same -sex blessings and same-sex civil uh, uh, bless same-sex marriages and bless uh, civil unions, they can be, uh, not deposed, but certain, well, and deposed in one way or another, they can be taken care of, George. And what's what's that we, called? What was the name exiled. of the, No, no. What's uh, the name of the group they put together that uh, investigates uh, um, clergy uh, 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 CDM, like clergy yeah. disciplinary measure? They'll be, yeah. They'll be yeah. If if uh, if we have uh, here's a scenario. Uh, somebody comes to my church who lives in my geographic parish area. I've never seen them before, but because yeah. it's the Church of England, they have a right to get married in the parish church, but they're a gay couple. And I say, I won't marry them. And I'm told I have that right. Well, they will file a CDM. I can see this happening. If And the CDM will say that the way he said no was insensitive to us. Offended me. And, yes. and so the charge will be homophobia or transphobia or whatever the phobia of the moment is. And this this priest will be suspended during the investigation, which could take one to two years, and his career is essentially over. So if I were leaders of the conservative wing, I would have a legally pre-approved rejection form that you don't have to say a word. You just hand them this little slip signed by the lawyers that says, this is why I'm not marrying you, and this has been okay and is not homophobic. It is, you know, this and that. This is the problem. There's no overarching organization. I mean, one of our uh, friends in the UK have said essentially there are four or five camps right now uh, in the conservative wing. They're the Anglo-Catholics, and unfortunately, they're divided. They're the traditional Anglo-Catholics who are liturgical traditionalists, and then they're the liberal Anglo-Catholics, and the liberal Anglo-Catholics are all on board the gay stuff. The traditional Anglo-Catholics who still oppose the ordination of women are divided on the homosexuality issue. Part of that is that a number of the bishops of the society are themselves gay. Um, and they cannot speak with any clarity because they are conflicted on this point. Now, I know it's an old slander to say the Anglo-Catholic movements that are all closeted gay men and whatnot, but there's just as all slanders have a tiny kernel of truth somewhere to make it sort of hang, there is enough of it mm. to basically say the Anglo-Catholics as a movement are not effective in holding the line in England at this time with the current leadership. Hear me now. I'm not saying the movement is bad or the thoughts are bad, but 
the leadership at this time is not going to hold the line. Well, and then we have. Well, I, I want to introduce like Alan Griffith, the guy who committed suicide, the the priest. He was investigated mm-hmm. uh, onto the point he had no recourse. There's nothing I can do. I'm investigated forever. And mm-hmm. the same can be used against a priest who does not want to conduct a same-sex blessing uh, of marriage or civil union. We recently, we were running a story about an evangelical priest in the Diocese of Southwark who, uh, who basically informed on the failures of his superiors to do adequate safeguarding. Mm-hmm. And because he talked to somebody outside the church, he himself was subject to a safeguarding complaint by his superiors for telling an outside person about somebody's being abused. Now, he was found guilty, but then his life uh, was put in limbo for months. Uh, the, the safeguarding is not honest in England. It's a weapon because it's not applied against bishops unless the bishop is out of favor. It's only applied against troublesome and recalcitrant clergy who, or and that can basically wreck your life forever. If you're truly a horrible human being and a dreadful bishop and all this and that, doesn't do anything, doesn't matter. You're protected. We've seen this again and again, especially in the church in Wales, where they've really got to have had a bad problem with some really bad bishops, uh, crop of them. But let, let, let's get, let's cross the border and go back into England. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and say, you know, among, so we've got the, we've got the traditionalist Catholic wing, which has essentially been neutered, partially because of the defections to the ordinary, partially because of their split themselves between liberals and tra- traditionalists, and also because their current leadership is not up to speed then among the evangelicals they range from we can win this fight to get out get out now there's one group and uh we uh see it in uh like people like ian paul who's on the archbishop's council and uh paul eddie who's a friend of this show who's on the spokesman for the global south fellowship of anglicans and his new convener of uh anglican orthodox think that we've got the theology, we've got the scripture, and we've got the numbers to turn the tide. And they're all true, but will they turn the tide? Then we've got the next group that's saying, we can contain this, but we've got to create a sanitary zone, a sanitized zone, a third province, because we can't trust the leadership to uphold this thing. And this is people like Andrew Goddard and uh, the Church of England Evangelical Council and places like that. And the Church of Even England Evangelical Council, after a little slow start, has put out some strong statements saying that we will need to have differentiation if we have gay marriage. And then there are the other evangelical groups like the sort of Renew constituency, William Taylor at St. Helens Bishop's Gate. Mm-hmm. They, we published their statements saying they're out from under Sarah Mullally or uh, who else? Uh, Holy Trinity Brompton, the Charismatics, they're absolutely silent. They don't want to hurt the HTB brand, but they're basically going their own way. Uh, they're doing their own thing. They're basically keeping low and keeping what they have safe. And then you go to the people who say, okay, we're out. We cannot, you know, the bishops have said, uh, the phrase is, uh, you're looking for a unicorn if you want. You'll likely find a unicorn before you find a independent third province. And uh, there was a quote I wrote down in talking to somebody that uh, the demands being made by the conservatives in the current climate are uh, illegal, impractical, impossible. That extraordinary mix is just not gonna come about because the bishops are about power. They don't care what scripture says. They don't care what theology says. They don't care what their constituents say. They only care to maintain their status. And we heard before that they're willing to lose, I, was it up to 30% if they uh, yes. went with, with a same-sex, well, and that was with same-sex marriage, not just the uh, this uh, 
little bit of blessing thing going on. And so they're willing to lose the 30% to, to get on with it, get this over with already. But I don't see any other province who went this route grow their church. Uh, Canada no, the, went this route and has not grown. The Episcopal Church has gone this route and uh, they're not growing. Does the Church of England expect anything other than uh, a path to failure in this? No, because the true model is not the Episcopal Church, because here the dioceses still have some degree of differentiation. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, what happens in New York may be annoying to me, but at the end of the day, I don't care right. down here in Florida. But I think you need to look at the Church of Sweden. Church of Sweden, there are some bishops who's, who basically were asked on TV, would you uh, ordain someone who refuses to do gay marriages? No, we will not. It's that simple anymore. If you're not if you're not all into gay marriage, if you're not all into the ministry of women, don't even think about becoming a priest, a minister in the Church of Sweden, because, you know, Sweden Swedes have sort of a collective collectivist mindset, and the mind is these liberal truths are are our gospel, and if you do not believe, get out, and that's the way the Church of England is going. If you don't believe. In what they believe, we'll send you to jail with the cops. We won't give you a job. We won't ordain you. We'll do a Calvin Robinson and uh, train you, but then refuse to ordain you because you're too smart, too bright, too black to be conservative. <sighs> That's the trajectory that the liberals want to take it. All right. So let's go through story one, Church of England, story two, Church of England, story three, uh, Urquhart, That's Church of England. Can we do D new? Okay, let's do the live stream. Did we talk about that yet? Now the Church of England. Yeah, yeah, you we have, did. Where they, the Dean okay. of Canterbury yeah. didn't do that. But so let let let's turn to Francis Pope Francis. Okay, finally. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. All right. So uh, the Vatican decided, hey, um, you guys are unclear, obviously, about what Pope Francis said. And since day one, we've been uh, kind of picking up the pieces behind Pope Francis. And this is day, not one, but certainly day something. And uh, let's clarify what he meant by sin and what he meant by crime. What are the clarifications, George? Well, Pope Francis gave an off-the-cuff report uh, interview to an AP Associated Press reporter uh -huh. like on a plane. And he basically, it's, it's like... The Vatican press office is like that guy following the parade and the ponies shoveling up the manure. And uh, yeah. <laughs> well, France, the headlines were homosexuality is not a crime. And the Vatican had a clarifying statement saying what Francis really meant to say was, first off, this was a casual conversation, not a statement of doctrinal position. So first off, just ignore what the man said. Second. A civil secular crime, Francis, and the Catholic Church has long taught the last generation or so that people should not be jailed for being homosexual. Correct. Yeah. Uh, but their sins, the sin, the action of homosexuality is a sin, and, and engaging in that sin violates God's law. But God's law is not necessarily secular law. So essentially, the Vatican had to come back in and restate essentially what the Catholic Church and still the Church of England and still the Episcopal Church teaches in their prayer books, but in practice uh, doesn't always follow. Yeah, I wonder what's going to think. Oh. Go ahead. <coughs> oh, and then the Francis gave a speech to the Roman Rota. Oh, geez. Which are the judges of the uh, marriage courts. And Roma, uh, he talked about marriage. And essentially... If reading between the lines, he said this Church of England bishops are full of you know what. There's no difference between marriage and uh, holy matrimony. What nonsense, you know, hair splitting. And then he went on to redefine between one man, one woman, to the exclusion of all others. And that's his, then he stepped in it again. He yeah, said it's yeah. everlasting. Now, is this a translation error or did he mean for life? Because when you say this marriage is everlasting, does that mean in heaven? That <laughs> means know. you can't get remarried. <laughs> uh, what does this mean? So expect another statement defining what everlasting Last means, end, which yeah. is, oh, well, Francis was thinking in Spanish and was translated into Italian, and the translation didn't quite grasp the nuances of what he was saying. Well, okay. So Francis what, what, what is does, leaving little bombs all everywhere. 
What does the Episcopal prayer book say? One man, one woman, uh, to death us do yeah. part. Yeah. Which is right. different from everlasting. A very different than everlasting. I don't think my wife would have signed up for this if she knew it was forever and ever and ever. So, all right, let's move on to uh, uh, Jean Venier. Vanier. Uh, Vanier? Right, Jean, it's, it, Jean it, it's Vanier. It's spelled Vanier. But okay, we'll go with Vanier. Uh, he was a man venerated in Catholic circles and beyond, and he is alleged to have sexually abused six women over the course of the decades. Now, a saint until a week ago, if I'm not mistaken, right? Mm, just Jean Vanier founded mm. La Arche communities, which are yeah. across the world primarily in French-speaking countries. Okay. And these are residential facilities for developmentally disabled adults. Mm -hmm. And Vanier was lionized. There were dozens of schools named after him in, for instance, Quebec and in France. Uh, Rowan Williams was a visitor, was, uh, you know, spoke so highly of him. A modern saint was Jean Vanier. Well, he died, and after his death, things began to come out slowly. Over six decades, he abused at least 25 women who have come forward, and he sexually abused them. And the Dominican priest, I think Philippe something or other, who, well, it was Vanier is the, the main culprit. Essentially, they were sexually abusing women and essentially saying, no one will believe you because you're retarded if you talk about it. And second, this is what God wants. So spiritual as well as physical abuse. And what the lesson is, not to say that, oh, oh, look, more Catholic scandals, but rather this is the problem. You know, the Episcopal Church, we've just come up with a calendar feast, a calendar uh, commemoration of uh, oh, Barbara Harris. Oh, that, Barbara Harris of Massachusetts, mm -hmm. a year or two after she dies. And the church traditionally waited 25, 50 years to make sure we found out everything. And we can't do that any these days anymore for politically correct categories of people. We must immediately celebrate and rejoice in them. Well, what would have happened if uh, Vanier was uh, sort of started down the process of commemoration in the Anglican calendar or down the process towards canonization of the Catholic calendar? Different processes, I know. Yeah, you're different. Yeah. What happens then when you figure out that uh, this is, you know, an evil person? Well, who, this is a man who engaged in evil. We well, we had that also within the ACNA, not in the ACNA, but uh, within uh, Protestantism. We had Ravi Zacharias. Uh, Ravi Zacharias uh, was one of our uh, great apologists, who turned out after he died, uh, the the rumors that we heard turned out to be true, and mm -hmm. uh, he had lived a life that was not godly. Um, but you were talking about, you know, we can't do things, we have to do things differently now because right now we venerate uh, the LGDP community, that the, there's a secular veneration of them. There, we, we venerate African Americans here in uh, the United States of America because uh, we have this white guilt about us. I have a book on my desk and I hope I can get this into focus. Okay. The book of Matt. Yeah. Hidden sure. truths about the murder of Matthew Shepard. Oh, sure. In the Episcopal Church, we have a developing cult of Matthew Shepard. The National Cathedral has a window dedicated to him now. Yeah. Matthew Shepard was a gay man who was murdered in a bar in Wyoming. And the narrative adopted by the Episcopal Church and his mother and whatnot is that he was murdered for his homosexuality. This book by an investigative reporter basically reports that Matthew Shepard was murdered by one of his gay partners for a drug deal gone bad. He was a meth addict, a meth dealer, and this was just the nasty sort of underbelly criminal class stuff that happens. And he happened to be gay and attractive and a university student, and so he's being turned into a martyr uh, to homophobia, when in reality he was a martyr to methamphetamines. But the Episcopal Church doesn't care about the facts. They have a convenient narrative and a plaster saint. And should we go down that road to have a festival for Matthew Shepard? Basically, what are we honoring? We're not honoring God, not even honoring, honoring Matthew Shepard because the Matthew Shepard we're honoring is not the real one. We're honoring our own prejudices, our own um, 
we're honoring ourselves by showing how virtuous we are in making up these things that we wish to celebrate. Um, it's just a sick world we're living in, and then we've got sick churches. Yeah. Sick, 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 sick. Well, all right, so do I have any other stories left here on my list of yes, stories? Yes, we do. We've got lots we do. of stories. Well, okay. Uh, so, uh, Atna. Diocese, well, yeah, let's do the ACNA story. Diocese of the, of the West has renamed itself the Diocese of All Nations and has moved fully into the ACNA. And this is uh, with uh, uh, Bishop Felix Orgy's uh, diocese, right? Yes, Felix, Bishop Felix and his suffragan and all the clergy and uh, parishioners of the Diocese of the West are now formally, completely with his name change, plugged into the ACNA world. And congratulations to Bishop Felix. It's been a long journey. It was a difficult journey at times. The Church of Nigeria at first was reluctant to let him go, but then agreed and released him formally to the ACNA. So welcome to the newest, full, complete wing of the ACNA, the yeah, Diocese nice. of All Nations. Yep, welcome on board. Uh, and now the mower is going by. But you know, it's you never know what's going to happen on a taping of Anglican Unscripted. The the guy who mows the lawn just showed up. Thanks. I got three. Uh, I got three more on my list. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Global South, Welby, and Pope Francis, as we alluded to, are in South Sudan, uh, spreading the peace. Yeah, and the ACNS is spreading the manure. Uh, they put out its press statement saying, "See." Justin Welby is loved in the Global South. All this stuff about not breaking fellowship, about removing him, that can be true because he's being welcomed both open arms by the people of South Sudan. Well, the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans, who led by the primate of South Sudan, released a statement saying, no, nope, sorry, this is not what's happening. South Sudan is di divided by war and revolution and political turmoil, and the visit of Francis and Welby and the moderator of the Presbyterian Church of Scotland, and those of the three big churches in South Sudan, the Anglicans, the Presbyterians, and the Catholics, they are all being welcomed to help bring peace to that region. But that does not mean, Justin Badiarama said, that all is well with Anglicanism. We're talking about South Sudan's politi politics here, and we'll take the help of anybody to get things towards a path of peace. And so this is a good thing Welby's doing, but the ACNS and uh, Anglican Consultative Council, by attempting to manipulate what's going on uh, into a PR push, they're violating uh, the... And here's something, did you know, Kevin, that in a week's time, the Anglican Consultative Council's meeting in Ghana and it shows how far we've fallen because Uganda, Rwanda, Nigeria, they're not sending delegates. The other African countries are sending delegates. And it basically, the ACC is now so unimportant that it doesn't really any merit any people getting up in arms about it. Well, how hard you know, could it be to send a person in Africa to Ghana? I mean, obviously, uh, they are so despised desp they dislike the ACC so much that uh, it's not worth the travel. No, well, well, the other churches, you know, Kenya, Tanzania, because you know, it's a hey, it's a free junket. Free junket. It's yeah. a, it's a trip. Nothing important is going to happen. Nothing taken will be decide anything. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, you know, it's just like going on a convention. Uh, you get out of town for a few days and get to sit in boring meetings, but then go be, get to play tourist. So let's move over to America and talk about the news here in North America. We used to have, protected by the Bill of Rights, freedom of religion, freedom of association, freedom of the press, lots of freedoms built in there, freedom to own a handgun. Um, and it was pretty well protected up until the last couple of years where presidents and administrations wanted to choose winners and losers. And we are to the point now where uh, your employment is not guaranteed based on your conviction to your religion. And we had uh, a couple cases, I can think of three or four off the, the top of my head, where a nurse would refuse to, perf to be in the surgical operation center where an abortion was performed because she was opposed to abortion. And up until the mid '80s, that was a protected. If you don't want to participate in abortion, you don't have to, don't, and you can't be fired for it. 
well, now, now you can be fired for it. And even further down the line here, I'm watching you gave me a story here. CVS fired a nurse because she would not provide an abortion pill. Yeah. Uh, the nurse's name is Paige Carey. Mm -hmm. She was a nurse practitioner at a CVS Minute Clinic, which is sort of a walk-in clinic in Virginia. And she'd been there for three and a half years, and she's a devout Catholic, and they all knew at CVS that she would not prescribe abortion drugs. She just wouldn't do it. And that was fine for them for three and a half years. Well, in the last three and a half years, things have changed. In Vermont, a nurse was compelled to assist in an abortion at a general hospital. She refused and was fired, and she sued, and the Justice Department under Donald Trump stepped into a sister, saying you can't fire her for her religious beliefs. This is an accommodated practice. Then when the new Justice Department under President Biden came in, they dropped their support, in fact, went to the other side. And this sort of gave the green light to corporations to sort of get rid of the religious who, you know, if you have a, if you have a nurse practitioner who's not prescribing abortifacients and CVS, that means you have to have somebody else who'll do it if you want the customer. So now CVS was safe in December after three and a half years and just after having gotten an exceptional work review, she was fired for not prescribing abortion drugs. And now there's a lawsuit starting, but uh, she has no recourse to the government uh, supporting her civil rights or freedom of religion. So she has to turn to people like the ADF Alliance for Defending Freedom to help her fight these battles. But, you know, we are uh, in a difficult place in our society. Well, when these uh, are, I, things on, are happening. I, it was going to happen. I mean, if a Christian Church of England bishop can persecute a layperson, what, why would we have trouble with secular businesses persecuting Christians? I mean, the Christians are doing it. Why can't the secular businesses do it, George? Because... Uh, It's morally wrong, but that doesn't matter. It's sad. And I, you would think, because the lawnmower has just been outside our RV for like 10 minutes here, that I have the, the biggest yard in, in all of Florida Grant. I don't. I don't know why he's taking so long here. The grass hasn't been growing that much. It's actually raining today for the first time. So my apologies for the, the noise outside. Let's finish up with our last story. And you and I have talked about... Uh, seminaries closing uh, inside and outside the Episcopal Church for the entirety of Anglican script at all, all 10 or 11 years. <laughs> and it's not stopping now. You tell me uh, T Tech Divinity is closing. Church Divinity School of the Pacific announced today that it was ending residential programs. And that, that's three months after General Theological Seminary announced in New York City that they would end residential theological programs. The current class, the class, current entering class, class of 2025 will be the last residential class. After that, they'll only offer online uh, training, no more residential. So what do we see happening here? Well, it's the adage, go woke, go broke. Episcopal Divinity School, that's shut down, uh, went that same path, no students online. Now it was merged into Union Theological Seminary in New York City, so it's gone. General Theological Seminary, it's essentially gone. Church Divinity School of the Pacific, it's going to be a diploma mill. Uh, with the seminaries that existed when I was in school, Seabury Western is gone, Bexley Hall is gone. They exist in forms where they have some professors and they do some online classes and this and that. But essentially, there are only five or six residential seminaries left. Virginia Theological Seminary, Swanee, which is the University of the South, Episcopal Theological Seminary of the Southwest, and Shoda House, Yale, and then, whether it's Episcopal or not, Trinity School for Ministry. It dropped the word Episcopal, which used to be in its title, but it still has Episcopal ordinance and training there. So let's say, what's that, uh, five and a half? Yale will always be there because it has more money than anybody knows what to do with. Uh, Swanee's got the University of South backing them. 
uh, Episcopal Theological Seminary of the Southwest. I don't know their financial status, but they may be next. And Virginia has some wealth behind it. But the adage, but who are the ones that are growing? Trinity Seminary and the Shoda House. And uh, go woke, go broke. Uh, the largest theological seminaries, the most successful ones of the nations, are the conservative ones that are overflowing with students. And Trinity's doing just fine, and the Shota House is doing just fine. And it's because they have, I think, attracted the Orthodox to study there. Well, they've also attracted donations. I know uh, when I'm talking to a, Trinity, a professor at Trinity, they like to say, you know, we can offer tuition-free education to students. And that's amazing. Well, Church Divinity School of the Pacific sold itself to Trinity Wall Street, mm -hmm. and that has more money than it. Money's not the whole thing, Kevin. No. Uh, do you really want to go spend three years of your life basically uh, being indoctrinated? Or do you want okay. to learn? And, and, and that's, it, that's the biggest thing here, because I have a friend I've known since the 80s. He went into the Army. He just recently retired from the army and decided that he's called to be an Episcopal minister. And he went to, uh, I don't, I don't want to tell you the one he went to, forget it. It's not, he went to a Episcopal seminary below the Mason Dixon line there, help you out. And so, uh, he has been there since last, uh, September. Yeah. He's still a freshman or what you would call a first year seminary student. And he recently posted in, in November that he had lost his faith and um, doesn't know what to do. They don't, it took the seminary two or, three, two or three months to do that to him. So, and he was a, a person of faith. Uh, he, now, he's still in seminary. You know, maybe he wants to get his faith back, but... Uh, um, well, you're not gonna get it in seminary. You're not going to get it in seminary. <laughs> See, what, An Episcopal I, seminary will deconstruct you like you've never been deconstructed before. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it depends upon the teachers so much of this. When I was at Yale Divinity School, we had an excellent group of conservative uh, professors. We had some really far out liberal kooks too. But uh, there was a, it was big enough and strong enough. There was a community there that uh, was God fearing, godly. Oh, Brevard Childs. Uh, uh, Christopher Seitz, Philip Turner, um, Avery Dulles. Avery, wow. Cardinal Dulles taught me systematic theology. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we had some real kooks and nuts, like Paul Marshall, the former Bishop of Bethlehem, who was a liturgy professor. You know, you took what you needed to do, and they just held your nose, and then sat at the feet of the great men and women of faith who were there. That's all gone. But they've gotten more money than they know what to do with, and so they'll continue... Uh, trying to be a second-rate Harvard Divinity School. Yeah. I, I, there, I'm not going to get invited no, to the no, alumni no. dinner. How's that? <laughs> it's all over. Well, I mean, they've all gone. Uh, Yale's gone downhill. Yale in in the 70s and early 80s was the place to go. Yeah, it was a, a wonderful seminary. I've t I know so many Yale seminary grads uh, that spoke so highly of their time. But I haven't heard one peep of a person who went to Yale in, in since 20, 2006 who said it was a great place. So, yeah, it, it is what it is. Uh, I think, let me check the list. That's it. That's it. We're out. We can. Oh, and now the lawnmower goes away. Thank you. Have a good weekend, Mr. Lawnmower. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 786 of Anglican unscripted.